This morning's gospel reading comes from Luke chapter 3, 1 through 18. I'm going to tell it to you. Marina sent me, when she wrote this sermon, she said, Cody, there's going to be some words in there that you're probably going to have a little trouble with. So I was on the phone with her to 1045 last night. <laughs> we will get through this. I, I really recommend you follow along in your scripture because I'm going to butcher some of this. We went through seven different versions of the Bible to finally find the one that I could get through the best. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea and Harold being Tracheach Galilee and his brother Philip Tracheach of the reign of Iturea and Trachonomius and Lustanius Tracheach of Abilene during the high priesthood of Annas and Capitus, that it's there. The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness, and he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance and forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the words of Isaiah the prophet. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways. And all the flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered, then, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. Whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And, and we, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. As the people were in expectation, and, the, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered to them, saying, I baptize you with water, but he is mightier, but he who is mightier than I is coming to, to strap the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is his, in his hand to clear his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquestionable fire. So with many other extraordinaries, he preached good news to the people. I asked Marina to write this. I didn't think she was. She wrote me six pages. <laughs> Today is the second Sunday of Advent. During Advent, we may want to surround ourselves with warmth of the manger and the gospel narratives of Jesus' birth. However, Advent mostly points us from the manger and the cross and focuses on our attention to Jesus' coming again. And how we are to prepare ourselves for that time. Today we read about John the Baptist, who was front and center in the gospel before Jesus begins his ministry. In today's gospel passage, we are steeped in the call of this locust-eaten, grisly bear of a towering, remarkable man, whose birth was remarkable and his lifestyle was remarkable. Yet what is so remarkable about him is what Jesus said of him in Matthew Chapter 11, verse 11. Among those born of women, there is not risen 
anyone greater than John the Baptist. Apart from the Lord Jesus Christ himself, there was no one who was of greater significance than Jesus' forerunner, John the Baptist. It is striking that John comes almost out of nowhere to announce the baptism of repentance. First of all, he was not in a prime location. He did not have a city center mega church with terrace amenities. He wasn't in a lovely suburban corner with plenty of parking with freeway visibility and tremendous highway access. No, he was ministering in the Jordan wilderness, which was with a deep depression through which the river Jordan flows to the Dead Sea. It starts at 600 feet below sea level and ends at 1,300 feet uh, below sea level. The location is described as a hot and habitable depression, which is, a, which is wild in every way and removed from all civilization. So here we have the most remarkable preacher in a dreadful place. And even there, the people came to hear him repent, be baptized, and be saved. Let's stop for a moment and reflect on Oxford's location. Some may think of Oxford as being remote, perhaps too royal, rural, to attract and draw new seekers. Some may be wondering, in this post-COVID world, who will come to this church to hear the gospel? Learn of Jesus, be a part of the kingdom ministry, and receive the love of the fellowship out here. However, the people come. However, the people came to John in the desert wilderness, hot and air, and far from civilization. John preached the gospel to the hearts who needed to hear, and indeed they came. People are coming and will come to Oxford because the gospel was preached and will continue to be faithfully preached in ministry and love for the kingdom of God is endeavored in this place. John's location is a reminder to us of an essential principle. There is no ideal place to serve God except the place in which he sets you down. God has placed you, Oxford, right here in this magnificent place to witness for the kingdom of God. They will come. The spirit of the Lord Jesus will lead them. In the first two verses we read the names of the biggest villains of that time. These are the people that involved not only John's unrighteous death, but they were involved in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah the son of the living God. John's ministry begins while they are in power. This is also another essential principle reminder for us. No matter how dark our times, our circumstances, or our context, God can overrule it all. The ministry of John, as he prepares a way for the Lord, takes place in the dark, in a dark, dark part of Israel's history. Even before we began the depth of this message, in the very darkest night, we can rest assured that God will do his brightest work. Bless the Lord. Going on, Luke summarizes John's ministry in verse 3. John came preaching a baptism of repentance and forgiveness of sins. John's calling of God's people to repent is that the very heart of John's ministry. This is our focus today. Repentance isn't exactly a word we associate with Christmas, but remember, Advent is a time to prepare for, for the one who is yet to come again, dealing with repentance is very fitting for this time.
John's preaching was stark, bold, and blunt. John was very straightforward in confronting the people with their own sin, and yet the crowds kept coming in great numbers to hear him. He plainly speaks of judgment, the wrath to come. He called on them not to give up just lip service to repent, but to give up life repentance, to show the evidence of real gospel repentance by the way they lived and the way they dealt with people that they had wronged. In verses 15 to 20, Luke shows us effects of John's ministry that he pointed to the Messiah and prepared the people for Jesus and his message. And next loud, Jesus. And yet Luke shows that in the spirit of John's faithfulness, not everybody responded positively to his message of the gospel and repentance. In fact, the chapter ends in verse 19 to 20, with one of those wickedest villains of the age throwing John into prison. The, this fact let us know that the faithful ministry of the word or the word does not always result in people embracing Christ by faith. Faithful preaching of the word can sometimes end up with people hating the message and the messenger. We see this in countries like China, India, Nigeria, to mention a few, where Christian ministries are clapped in irons, imprisoned, and put to death. The context of Luke displays the horrible oppression of the government and the unfaithful religious leaders. Does this atmosphere of today reflect the era of John and Jesus were living. Why is repentance so important? Why is repentance to the coming ministry of Jesus the Messiah? John will say later that Jesus is the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. But really, what is repentance? Quote from J.D. Walt. It is the realignment of one's life with what matters most. It is breaking away from and preparing for and running toward. It is the recognition of the mounting, the satisfactions of the relationship with God in the pit of our soul. Repentance is the awakening of our souls that sometimes must change in our minds and our hearts about sin. Repentance is a deep soul call to line up our minds with how God views sin. God is holy and pure and he hates evil. In repentance we move from the loving our sin to hating it. Yes, John spoke about the present harmful effect of sin, but he also had in mind future things, future judgment. John warns them in verse 7 and verse 9 to flee the wrath of God which is coming. All is about repentance and sin is wrapped up in faith. Faith that trusts and believes that what God says is true. If we do not believe God is real or that God is holy and just and punishes wrongdoing, we will never repent. We can't be forgiven of sin if we don't acknowledge that sin is sin and our dire need to be forgiven. John makes it clear that repentance is necessary and vital for forgiveness. Luke summarizes John the Baptist the Baptist ministry in the terms of his preaching of repentance and repentance we humbly confess and self-surrender to God. Here we are living in a world of self-indulgence and it is all about me theology. 
So when he listens to the need of repentance, the people hearing John the Baptist back in the Judean wilderness were not much different from people now. In every age, people will listen and actually long for the word of truth beyond the voices of their own time. This is why the word of God is vitally important. All the other voices we hear are bound by the time in which we live in any era that's lived, or any era that's lived, excuse me. It is only the word of God spoken in truth that transcends time and space, carrying the voice of John the Baptist, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, repent. Let's land, land on a verse in particular that is especially significant. Verse eight, bear fruit worthy in keeping with repentance. In other words, John is saying, don't tell me about your repentance. Show me your repentance. If Advent is a time for preparation for the Lord so that all flesh shall see the salvation of God, we just found a powerful way to prepare. Bearing fruit of worthy repentance, what does that really mean? What does bearing fruit require? Bearing fruit, fruit comes at the end of a process, not at the beginning. Fruit begins by breaking up fallow ground and sowing and cultivating and fertilizing and watering and more cultivating and more waiting and finally, by God's grace, fruit. Maybe repentance can't be reduced to just a verbal statement or confession. Maybe it takes sustained attention, intention, and effort. By the power of God's word and spirit, Jesus wants to reach deeper than our mere behavior into our dispositions, desires, and affections. Since Advent is a time when we prepare for Jesus to return, we are called to repent, show, and display the salvation of the Lord in our lives, may we humbly ask God to identify the deeper places where repentance is needed. It may be a symptom of something like a short temper, judging another sin, an addiction of food or drink, questionable viewing, gossip. Then may we to leave beneath uh, the surface of that behavior and ask the deeper questions about our brokenness beneath. Sometimes battling the brokenness of our sinful behavior is overwhelming. If so, what would it be like if new seeds were sown in our souls? Seeds that can grow into very different patterns. In what ways could we cultivate water, fertilize those new plants in the Lord of our lives? Would prayer and reading and meditating on the Word of God cultivate this new seed? Would giving your time and talent and money to bless a person or a family and help to fertilize the new seed? Or admitting that you were wrong and asking forgiveness from a friend water the new seed. If we were so serious about bearing fruit of our repentance and cultivating good seed from the Lord, would the watching word long to know why our behavior showed honestly and acceptance of our, our responsibility? Would the watching world also long to own a fault without blame shifting, without excuses, without denial, along with the sacrificial giving as they see it in you. 
Bearing the fruit of repentance shows the work of Jesus Christ within our souls and out of this transformative new planet as we can testify and witness to the one who in his great love and mercy for us causes change causes our change to love and give and forgive. John is calling us to a life of that kind of repentance. Bearing fruit is a beautiful life. Preparing for Jesus, Jesus' return by cultivating fields of our hearts to overflow with good fruit for him as a powerful witness for his gospel and his kingdom. May we draw near to Jesus, look to him and say in, stay in and meditate on the scriptures and be in prayer daily. Stay in fellowship with God, with God's people, because we need a, need one need one other to keep our hearts looking toward and living in the Lord. Be encouraged to bear the fruit as we prepare for Jesus' return. From the book of Isaiah, the 60th chapter in the very first verse, Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen. Amen.